So last week, uh, you've heard us using the word streaks. We started this series that we're calling Streaks, and by streaks, what we're talking about, and by the way, if you have the Version Bible app, this is, we have put this in the notes for today, so our notes are in there with the verses and everything, but uh, when we talk about a streak, we're talking about something that you do intentionally uh, and consistently, or do not do consistently and intentionally, because it gets you somewhere that you want to go. And so I asked you last week for some help. If you would share with me something, a streak that you have, something that you intentionally do or don't do, right? Because it's going to get you somewhere that you want to go. So here's, so some of the things that we received this past week, uh, one of them is that we have a, a Wordle streak going uh, and your goal is to complete Wordle every day. How many of you do Wordle? Can I just see your hands? I'm just very, yeah, okay. Uh, so we've got some Wordlers uh, here in our in the group. Uh, and, and that's good because we know that when you engage puzzles of that sort, it, it engages your mind and that's, that's good for you in the long, long term. I, I do also wonder if some of us just have the incessant need to be right. But uh, at any rate, um, I wanna, someone said, I want to be intentional about sharing, uh, encouraging my family by text weekly of my faith and to be a disciple and to love God with all of our hearts, which I think is incredible. Someone said, I want to eat three to five servings of fruit or vegetables a day. Someone said, to save money every paycheck biweekly to meet financial goals. That's incredible. Last week, I mentioned uh, that there are those who are trying to stop. Right? So here's they're trying to stop smoking. And someone sent in last Sunday. So that day, last week, on that day, uh, someone responded to that comment. They said, today makes seven days without a cigarette. I want to make it past 100 days. I've only ever been able to make it to 100 days, and I hope to be done with it forever. And I just want to say, if you're in the room, if you're online, I think that's, inc I think that's incredible. I think that's incredible, and I hope you can get beyond that to where you just aren't messing with it anymore. So, hey, so thanks for being here with us. If this is your first Sunday with us in the room, if it's your first Sunday with us online, my name's Mike. I'm the lead pastor here at MCC. And the idea for this series uh, has come from habits or disciplines that as disciples of Jesus, we need to develop that will have the greatest impact on our lives if we do them consistently uh, and really daily is what we're shooting for. Uh, so hence streaks. And to be clear, right, if this is your first time with us, I realize when we say the word disciple, that might not be a word you're familiar with. When we say disciple here at MCC, we mean something very specifically, and so it's in the notes. I want to make sure you take that home, but a disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission uh, of Jesus. And during this series, we're looking very specifically at what God uses in our lives so that we are being changed by him. It's all about life change. Our faith is about life change. And when we talk about being changed by Jesus, listen, we don't, it's not that we have to do this hard work and just try really hard. Uh, it's really about surrendering to God through the process of what these habits that we develop and what he does through those habits and through that process and how he builds us layer by layer. So last week we began with the discipline that surrounds scripture. By far, said last week, just a reminder, by far the number one catalyst for your faith, if you want to grow, regardless of how long you've been following Jesus, is how you engage God's Word, reading and reflecting, what's it saying, how am I applying this to my life? That's by far the number one uh, catalyst to growth. This week, it's all about prayer. Last week, we looked at what Paul said to Timothy. This week, we're going back and looking one more time at what Paul told his young friend, Timothy. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes this, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. It pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald uh, and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, not lying. Uh, a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So I just, from the very beginning, I want to make sure that we understand what Paul, when he talks about prayer, he's not talking about people who merely 
pray at prescribed times of the day or certain events in their life, but people who realize that the direction and the outcome of our lives depends on God. You know, it's interesting, the last couple of weeks, prayer has been all over the news during the Bengals-Bills game. I'm sure you've already heard, 24-year-old Damar Hamlin received more than 30 minutes of medical attention on the field, including CPR, to bring him back to life. That week, I watched the clip multiple times. I'm wondering if you did as well. I didn't see it live, but I heard about it. I went back, and I just kept watching that clip, and it, it was hard to watch. It blew me away that someone... What I was trying to wrap my mind around was how could someone who was so young and in such good shape, how could, how could they experience cardiac arrest on a field like that? Now, thankfully, if, I don't know if you've been keeping up with it. He's doing better. He's out of the hospital. Actually, if I read correctly, yesterday he was at the team facility uh, to, to talk to folks. But the immediate, now what I want to take you back to is when they realized on the field how serious this was. The immediate response of the team, I don't know if you saw it or not, but they went to their knees in prayer. And I'm just curious, if you were asking yourself, why in this moment of deepest need, when they knew they could do nothing, the, the team, they, they were helpless in this situation, why did they feel the need to do that? Well, let me bring it into this room this morning. A friend once said to me, a church cannot grow beyond the prayers of its people. Do you believe that? Because I got to tell you, I do. Apparently, Paul did as well in chapter 2 and verse 1. He tells us, and I want to make sure you get this, because when we talk about being disciples and habits that grow us and disciplines that move us forward in our faith, disciples make prayer a priority in their life. Uh, verse 1 says, I urge you then, first of all, so he's talking about worship. In this whole chapter, he's talking about worship. And so I want to make sure you understand those words, first of all, they could mean that uh, prayer was to happen first. He could, that's what he could mean, is that prayer really needs to happen first in worship. Could be what he meant, but that's not what he's talking about. It could also mean, I have a list of items I want to talk about when it comes to worship. And the first one I'm going to talk about is prayer. It could mean that, but that's not what he's talking. That's not what he's saying. By first of all, Paul is saying that prayer has to have a place of priority. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, prayer has to have a place of priority in your life. When we read through the Gospels, we see when Jesus prayed, right? He, before he chose the apostles, before he chose the 12, he went on the mountain and he prayed all night long. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he's about to make this big decision about his earthly ministry, and he needed to be alone in prayer. In the upper room with his disciples, Jesus spent time in prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was crucified, on the cross while he was crucified, he prayed from the first day of his ministry to the last day of his ministry. We see that prayer was front and center with him, but it wasn't just, listen, in those momentous milestones of his life. If you follow Jesus in the gospel, you'll notice that every day Jesus is praying when he heals people, when he eats a meal, when he takes a trip, when he was teaching people, when he was in the temple, on and on and on and on. Jesus would make prayer just this part of who he was. He was not a person who prayed he was a person of prayer, permeated his life from the moment he woke up until the moment he would go to sleep. Listen, I'm wondering if this hit you like it did me, because when I saw this for the very first time on ESPN, uh, it was January 5th, former NFL player, now uh, ESPN analyst Dan Orlovsky. Uh, watch, watch what he did on his show. Um, football gave me everything. You know, and I think even through the midst of absolute tragedy last night, I think you saw some of the beauty of football mm -hmm. as well, that it's brought us all here together. Um, you know, like, this is a little bit different. I heard, I've heard it all day, like, thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say, like, we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want to, it's just on my heart that I want to pray for It is. Damar Hamlin right, right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him. Um, God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, uh, because we believe that your God and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're, we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you and pray for 
strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar, to be with his family, to give them peace. If we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. We lift up Damar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 It's beautiful. Respectfully. Yeah. I don't know what religious channel you watch. That wasn't on it. Okay? I just want to say, uh, this was on ESPN. And he said, if we didn't believe that prayer works, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. I, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. That's a powerful statement. I don't know if you noticed. He did like a tutorial on prayer. And so in case you don't know, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to bow my head. In case you're wondering what's going on when I do that, right? For those uninitiated. So I just want to say that here, I don't know if you noticed, uh, my buddy Tim put the new prayer walls up for us. Took the old ones down. They're upstairs in the offices. We brought, we put new ones up, put some new ones up in the balcony as well. But I want to make sure that you know this past year, our, our, we would, people would pray on Sunday mornings. You would write things on those to pray for. People would pray on Sunday mornings. Our elders would pray. Our staff, during our staff meeting on Wednesdays, when we come to our time of prayer, we just come down here to this room. We all take a board, and we stand in front of it, and we pray for what's on that board. And some of the things, you, you can feel the weight. I'm burned out. My battle with anxiety. My battle with food addiction. The people of the Ukraine, clarity, a job to be a great dad and husband, for God to move in our blended family, for Ed to find Jesus before it's too late. And he did, just in case you were wondering. For my daughter to have courage to leave an abusive relationship. So I, I mentioned last week that Timothy was raised in a religious home. He not only had been taught how to pray, he'd been taught how to pray he knew the importance of prayer, but what Paul is writing to Timothy here is to remind him that prayer has to be a priority in the church's worship and life. And I wonder if Paul is writing because Timothy is in this difficult city in which to start a church, to build this church, and he needed reminded. And I say that because sometimes when things get tough or life gets so fast-paced, I need to be reminded. And I wonder if you ever sense that as well. Sandy will catch me every once in a while, and she will say, have you prayed about this? And I will look at her with the most incredulous look on my face that I can muster and say, I'm the lead pastor of the church. What do you think? And she'll say, I think you haven't really taken time to pray about this. <laughs> and she's right, you know? I mean, sometimes there's just so much to do and I get moving so fast and I get so busy doing things for God that I forget to just take time and stop and be with God. And I wonder if I'm the only one in the room who does that around here. Richard Foster said, we will never have time for prayer. We must make time. I just want to say that God works on and in the lives, through the lives of those around us because of our prayers. And so I put this in your notes, wanted to make sure you took this as well. A disciple prays intentionally. So there's some things that we're doing very intentionally. And, and I want to make sure you understand when I say that, first of all, we ask for guidance. Paul would write, I urge then, first of all, the petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. The New Living Translation says, I urge you then, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Now, that word petition, just so we understand these words, can be used of a request, of a request made either to another person or to God. But there's this fundamental idea of dependency that goes with it. So I just want to lean back into Orlovsky's prayer for just a moment because he hit it. God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, because we believe that you're God. And, and coming to you and praying to you has impact. We're sad. We're angry. We want answers. But some things are unanswerable. And petitions remind us that some things are out of our control. But they also remind us that even if they are in our control, 
that we still need to take them to Jesus if we're going to be a disciple of his. It's, it's recognizing that some needs can only be met by God. That, that word implies a sacredness, a reverence for who God is. The next word is intercession. It originally meant to meet a person and to hold this intimate conversation with them. And then it acquired this special meaning of, of coming into a king's presence uh, to submit a petition to him. It, it, it implies this nearness, an intimate relationship with God. The last word, thanksgiving, we really don't even need to explain it. I just wonder if we do it. I like the words of George Herbert who said, O oh, thou who has given us so much, mercifully grant us one more thing, a grateful heart. And as I was looking at the boards from last year, Somebody, as part of what they had written, it's not the whole thing they wrote, but part of what they wrote on the board was, thank you, Lord. I don't, I don't say it enough. And I wonder if you recognize that in your prayer time as well. Do you take time when you come before God to recognize that you're coming before him because you, you need him? You, you depend on him. And when you approach him, is it is it out of reverence for who he is? Is there an intimacy? Is there a familiarity uh, knowing that you're not in the presence of this God who's off somewhere and you hope if you just shout loud enough that maybe he will hear your insignificant voice calling to him over the void in the darkness? I love this image because it reminds us how untrue that picture is. And, and the, the question really is, do, do you remember to thank God for access to your father like this? You know, I've told you before that my prayer life has changed over the years that I've followed Jesus, and my, my guess is that yours has and will as well. But I've recognized more and more uh, what I need to pray for as I've done that. I've created this journal where I track what and who I'm praying for marriages that need mended, and hearts that need softened, and bodies that need healed, and people that I care about a great deal who don't know Jesus, and friends who used to follow Jesus and, and have strayed from Him. And every Monday, I pray Psalm 4610 for myself, and I remind God, but mostly me, that I have surrendered my day to Him, and I'm trusting Him, uh, and I'm asking for guidance in that day. And so I actually, I will go right through my calendar for that day and for the week because there are things that are coming that I know they're on my calendar. They're coming this week. But I also know that there are things I don't know about that are coming, sure shooting, they're coming my direction. I just can't see them because they're not on my calendar, but he knows they're coming. And so I ask him to help me. Hebrews 4 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's this intentionality about how a disciple prays, seeking this guidance from God on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but also uh, this intentionality in what specifically we're praying for. Look at verse 3. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. And really, this is the ultimate aim of our prayers. It's verse 4. For everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. So let me invite you, if you're not already doing this, would you keep a list of people that you're praying for that you care a great deal about? And if they were to die today, they would be separated from God for all eternity because they don't, they don't know Him. Uh, instead of this sh shotgun approach, oh God, just save everyone who's not saved in the world. Why don't you use more of a pistol approach? And uh, which maybe is a bad analogy, but uh, this intentional prayer asking God to use you and circumstances and other people to steer your five lost friends that you care about. You listen, you care about them to steer them to him. Watch and see what Jesus does. Be ready to cross names off your list as he brings people to himself, and then you'll be able to add other names to that list. Second, uh, Peter would write this, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. For God's dream to become reality, it will require his people to put lost people on their heart by putting them in their prayers. And can I remind you, this isn't just about other people. Verse 5 reminds us that Jesus is our mediator with God. 
And our need for forgiveness doesn't end with our decision to follow Jesus, which is why part of our prayer when we talk about being intentional about what we're asking to start doing and stop doing is it recognizes our need to ask God for forgiveness every day. Now, I share that because I assume you struggle with sin. I assume that because I struggle with sin. And so I thought maybe you would as well. And so every day we need to come clean with Jesus. James reminds us, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so I just want to make sure, listen, don't confess your sins to just anyone. But confess them to someone who you know loves you and loves God and will pray for you and what's going on, what you're struggling with, because there's healing in that. It's why John would write to the church. Listen, when John wrote the letters at the end of the Bible, he's not writing to non-Christians. He's writing to people who have made a commitment already to Jesus when he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So as I drive here on Sunday mornings, this morning included, my prayer Each week is almost the same thing, probably almost word for word at this point. But Father, please help what I say this morning. Please please help it not just be helpful for those who are listening, but please help what we're talking about this morning. May that reflect reality in my life as well especially if I'm struggling in the area that we happen to be talking about that day. And every Monday, I begin each week praying for me to remain faithful to Jesus, to be the husband that he wants me to be for Sandy, to be the the man he's calling me to be. And I know there are others of you. Some of you have told me that you pray for me every day, and i got to tell you how much I appreciate that. I know I need to be reminded daily who I belong to and who I who I'm trying to become like, and that I need his help. Verse 8 says, therefore, I want uh, people everywhere to pray, lift up whole, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. That, that phrase, lifting up holy hands, it's found all over the place in the Old Testament. In 1 Kings 8, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel. He spread out his hands toward heaven, and he said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. And then David Uh, His dad, David, would write in Psalm 141, may my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. This lifting of hands was this Jewish attitude and posture for prayer, kind of like when we bow our heads, right? That's this act of, if you're wondering why you bow your head and close your head, it's an act of reverence before God. But the early church would adopt this posture, this attitude of hands, raised toward God. But the main thrust of that verse isn't just about raising hands. The main thrust of the verse is about raising holy hands before God. Holy hands symbolize a life of purity before Him. So, uh, so I, I watch, if you're for friends on, on the YouVersion app, I actually get to see what you highlight, what you're reading, if you make that visible to people. I noticed a few weeks ago, Susan Patrick highlighted Psalm 130. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. Dale Huber, one of our guys here, uh, highlighted Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. There's this enormous potential that is available to us when we go to God in prayer. But can I say, it only remains potential if we don't go to God in prayer. It's still out there. We just haven't availed ourselves of it. There's, I agree with Jack Taylor who wrote this. It's in the notes. No believer's spiritual life will rise above the level of his praying. No church's ultimate effectiveness will rise and stay above the level of its corporate prayer life. And no church's corporate prayer life will be greater than the personal prayer lives of those who make up its constituency. In other words, a church will never progress beyond the prayers of its people. Someone said this, a church stays on its feet when its members get on their knees. So this is why, this is why we stop every week. And we do, what we do together every week 
is kind of a model for what we ought to be doing individually in our day-to-day lives. When we take communion, right? So we come before God and we, we remember who he is. I, I, my reading was in Job this past week. And I got to tell you, you can't read Job without remembering he's creator. Uh, because he makes that abundantly clear at the end of the book. Creator, king, father, dad, and who you are to him, child, son, daughter of God. And talk about where you've been. And talk about all the times that you helped other people see him. Talk about the times you didn't. When you, when you failed to reflect his image to those around you, you marred the image of our Father. We all are guilty of that. He just wants to hear us talk about that and confess that to him and recommit yourself to him that day because it reminds him, but mostly it reminds us, who we belong to and who we live for. And so we're going to observe communion together. I will lead us through that here in just a moment. I'm going to pray, then I'll walk us through that, and that's what we're going to do, all right? So let's pray. Father, we, we, we come to moments like this, and we recognize <laughs> maybe more than at any other time our great need for you because we've come to remember that Jesus gave his life on the cross for our sins And so this debt, this sin debt that we have had, he paid. Again, because we we couldn't, we, we couldn't pay that debt. He took it for us. And that is humbling to think that the Son of God would leave his rightful place of worship in heaven to come here to die a horrible, brutal, brutal, to be murdered on earth. So God, we just want, we need that to sink in so that we can remember just how much you love us. And so we come before you now, and part of what we want to confess is that we love you and we know that we belong to you. And that there have been times this week that we have succeeded wildly and have helped people see your face and hear your voice and sense your presence and feel your touch just through hours. But we know there have been other times when we have failed miserably. And sometimes it was kind of accidental. Still had the same effect, still had the same impact. And other times it was quite intentional. We knew exactly what we were doing when we did it. And we knew it did not honor you, but it was what we wanted. So we ask for your forgiveness when we choose what we want over what you want. When we choose what we want over who you call us to be. When we decide to do what we think is best rather than what you and your word and Holy Spirit, how you guide us, what you tell us is best. So we ask for your forgiveness. And we recommit to you again, because we love you. Thank you for loving us. And Jesus, we pray this in your powerful name. Amen.